Here we go. Well, good morning. Welcome, everybody, to our time today. Uh, and it's uh, Haksameic Independence Day uh, for Israel, although they're probably at this time coming very, very close. Well, I guess they'll still be uh, sunset, uh, sunshine there. So at sunset, uh, this Independence Day will come to a close, but they'll be celebrating all day long. It's the 71st birthday um, of Israel's independence. So uh, they just came through Memorial Day uh, where they had sirens going at different times in the day, uh, particularly at 11 o'clock, and I saw some videos where everything stops. Most everything stops. <laughs> they think there were a few people driving, probably Arabs or Palestinians who uh, don't obey, but everybody else, all the Jewish people uh, in Jerusalem and this was taken from Tel Aviv. Everything stopped. It showed the shopping malls. Everybody stopped for a full minute and remembered. And, uh, and many, many people visited the cemeteries. Many, many people took time just to reflect and remember the, the thousands upon thousands that have lost their lives defending uh, Israel. And so that was a very time of sadness. But then they move immediately into joy, you know, all day in sadness. And then they move into joy on the uh, evening. And then they continue the next day, today, in celebrating. And it is a holiday, a major holiday, where, you, you know, even the news, you don't get newscasts, you don't get news, anything. And uh, yesterday, though, there was nothing on their televisions either. Um, you, you can't get any programming on Israeli television. It had to come from outside. All Israel television was just uh, either silent or showing memorial uh, scenes of war, scenes of loss, scenes of remembrance. Yeah. And so they, they really are taken very, very serious. Uh, now, so I just wanted to take a, 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 a small clip. And this is to remember, this is this came across, it's an animated clip, and I listened to it, and it's had a lot of hits on it, and I thought, wow, that is really good. And then I thought, well, maybe there might be a better one out there. And so what I did was I tried about three or four others. I wanted a short one, like five minutes or less. And uh, I would have gone up to nine minutes, but I tried about three or four more clips, just about Israel's independence. I had put in uh, Israel's independence 1948. Well, the clips I received were, I was astounded. These were written by not pro-Israel people. They were from Palestinian, and there's all kinds of them out there. I went through four different clips that started out, looked good, like you wouldn't know it by their title, and you wouldn't know it by the first lines. And then all of a sudden, you realize they're saying Israel stole the land from the Palestinians. And I'm going, what? And so I listened to a couple of them just to want to see what their arguments were. Their arguments were foolish, really. I mean, they were lies. And uh, some of them were close. You know what I mean? There was truth in it, but they distorted it in such a way that I went, Oh my goodness, I, I was astounded at it. And so I went back to this clip and I said, this is a good one. <laughs> and it's written, you know, and I should have, you know, right away I knew it because it's talking about, um, I think it's from, from the Zionist position, I think I said. So um, that you just have to be careful what you listen to. There's a lot of stuff out there and, and a lot of people out there, even CTV News last night when they were talking about the Israel and the Independence Day, they actually used, they said uh, what was happening in Gaza, it was Hezbollah. Well, it's not Hezbollah, it's Hamas. Come on, you get your facts straight. But then they went on to talk about the Independence Day in which, uh, uh, they, which they have claimed Jerusalem, which is a Palestinian city, oh as God. well as a, a Jewish city. It's not a Palestinian city. It never was a Palestinian city. It never was a head of any Muslim uh, area. They was even when the Muslims control the land, it was a nothing. Jerusalem was nothing to them. Now it's become now 
um, the, the Temple Mount, but only because Israel became a nation and um, the Temple Mount was important to many of the Jews, not all. And uh, so as a result, all of this it gets changed. Anyway, this story here, let's listen to it. Uh, it's, it's, I, I liked it. It's fairly accurate, or very accurate. So let's go. On a small podium stands a determined Zionist leader before a hastily convened gathering, reading out a proclamation which would change the course of history. This is how the state of Israel was born. First, a bit of background. At the end of World War I, the Allied powers gained control over the Middle East, including the land of Israel. The League of Nations recognized the historical connection of the Jewish people to their land and granted Great Britain a mandate to help them reconstitute a national home. However, Arab riots and geopolitical considerations led to a series of British restrictions on Jewish development and immigration. Even ships, including displaced children and Holocaust survivors, were sent back to Europe. Jewish resistance grew as well. By 1947, the ball was back in the United Nations court, where a majority of the nations decided on November 29th, after a tense vote, to divide the land into a Jewish and an Arab state. The Jews rejoiced. The local Arab population, well, they launched a war throughout the country. May 15, 1948 was the date the British mandate officially ended, the date the Jewish state was to be declared, and the date five regular Arab armies planned a coordinated attack to annihilate the newborn state. On May 12th, David Ben-Gurion convened the People's Council. The atmosphere was grave. Moshe Sharet reported that the Americans are demanding a postponement of the declaration or else they would not help Israel against the United Arab invasion. Golda Meir reported that King Abdullah had retracted his original agreement and will join the attack. Military leaders expressed serious doubts about the ability of the small Jewish community to withstand five regular Arab armies equipped with European weaponry. But somehow, after 13 hours of deliberations, Ben Gurion succeeds in swaying the balance against the American demand. And on Friday, May 14th, in the presence of local Jewish leaders, he declares the establishment of the State of Israel. The proclamation, which was inspired by the American Declaration of Independence, asserted the historical and moral rights of the Jewish people in its historic homeland and defined Israel as a Jewish democratic state based on equal rights, freedom, and justice. The declaration ended with a call on Jews to return home and extended a hand for peace towards the local Arab population and neighboring Arab countries. The Arab invasion was immediate and lasted for over a year. Close to 50% of Israel's small fighting force were survivors of the Nazi death camps who vowed never again. One out of every hundred Jews living in Israel died in the fighting. But by the end of the war, the small Jewish state had emerged victorious as an independent nation in this homeland for the first time in 2,000 years. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so as a result, um, yeah, I just cancel it. Okay. Thank you, Lord. So I do want to transition into um, the, the, the teaching for today and I'm going to be using the Parsha readings that are coming up this week. Parsha reading is the Jewish uh, readings from Torah that uh, continue on weekly. So 19 and 20, Leviticus 19 and 20 are the uh, readings. I've chosen 20 because uh, it really focuses on the need for holiness. Actually, 20 talks about uh, the punishments that come from disobedience to the calls of what's in previous chapters. But I, I liked it because it focuses on the need for holiness. And I want to just say, I'll, I'm going to conclude my message um, by, as we go through Leviticus 20, is by saying um, the holiness, uh, how we see holiness, has changed somewhat from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, 
the application of it, the, the importance of it has not, but the application of it has. And that's because of the cross, because Jesus came and died on the cross and paid for our sin and brought holiness to you and to me because he dwells in us. And that changes everything. They did not have, the Jewish people did not have, in prior to the cross, they did not have God dwelling in them. They did not have the holiness of God dwelling in them as we do with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That changes a lot, and we need to understand that. Now, again, I just before, I'll come back to this again, um, and I, I counted this again last night. I was trying to get finished, and, but I took time to answer some a person who was in a dilemma, in a, a question about um, the situation. And, and, you know, I'm involved in different ministries, but, you know, I'm also in the church. And so we get people and they call me very often because I'm a father or because I'm a pastor or whatever and think they can get a hold of me. We can't get others. <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, I, I do act out of love. And, but the whole area that they were talking about was based on you have to understand that you cannot make a theology out of the Old Testament alone. If you are going to take a story like, say, Job and build your theology around what you read in Job, I believe you will come to a very flawed theology. You need to, you say, well, are you saying Job's theology is wrong? I'm saying you need to take the theology in Job and the, the principles in Job and look at it through the cross. You cannot look at it by yourself. And so when you look at what God has done with punishments for various sins, and I and, know and we, it's really amazing sometimes uh, people, Big ministries will base their theology on segments of the Old Testament, okay? And uh, but but they don't look at it from a New Testament standard. So say for homosexuality, uh, I mean they, they'll say they're totally against homosexuality, but they won't. They say, well, but the death <coughs> capital punishment, which was the crime, you'll see, is it, it doesn't apply. And so they pick and choose, but they don't look at it through a New Testament uh, viewpoint, through the cross, through how Jesus sees it. it the, it's still important. You know, it's still a major sin. Yes, homosexuality is. But how you see that applied will be very different through the cross. Because we moved into a, a place from sin, uh, 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 law, um, uh, um, sin and punishment, if you will, and versus uh, truth and grace and mercy through the cross. And so you need to take those in, in, in uh, conjunction together to see together. So I'll try to explain a little bit more of that, but I want to just start off with saying that because you're going to hear some things immediately that go, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So you have your outlines, and I, if you, those who are listening um, from online right now, you would be able to download that through the email, or you can send it to us if you're listening to later, and we can send you the outline. But the theme of the book, if you notice in your outline, and let me actually begin by saying that, again, the need for holiness is the topic. And so the theme of Leviticus is a call to holiness. And it's very, very important that holiness is still called for, uh, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. But as I said, you'll see some differences in how it is applied. Uh, in Leviticus, we see uh, it's, the book is, and it's mostly neglected. Many in the church neglect the Leviticus. It's all about laws, and they just skip through it. If you're doing your daily readings, you probably spend very little time in going through Leviticus. And especially the laws and the very thing. You'll just read them through maybe or maybe even skip them. But uh, it's amazing because when you look at the overall principles, if you see the principles, you see, oh, my goodness, they actually do totally apply in the New Testament to us as believers. For example, in Leviticus 1 to 16, the first 16 chapters, 
the focus is on the way to God is by sacrifice. Now they were talking about animal sacrifices, yes. But is that principle still involved for us today? Absolutely, but not animal sacrifices. The way to God is who way by by sacrifice. What sacrifice? It's Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and it's by what Jesus did. And yes, we are to pick up our cross daily and follow Him. Be putting to death the flesh and putting the bringing all the stuff that comes into our life, the cross, the, the heaviness, and uh, uh, allow Him to take all of that. But it's still the way to God for you and me is through Jesus, Yeshua. The only way is through his death, through the cross, through his sacrifice. There is no other way. And so that has stayed the same. Now, the second part of Leviticus in verse 17, chapter 17 to chapter 27, is the walk with God is by sanctification, through sanctification. And so uh, and definitely it was very, very strong that they were taught they need to walk with God by practicing holiness, by doing holiness and they had different ways of way of doing that and that has changed also in the new testament of how we apply that holiness but we're still called the principle still called we need to walk out the holiness that has been imputed to us given to us through jesus we need to walk it out with our conduct and he's calling for holy living and he's calling us to walk with him bringing forth what has been put in us. So it's a different uh, application, but it's exactly the same principle. Now, in uh, this chapter 17 of Leviticus, which we have not studied in chapter 18, 19, leading up to 20, you'll see that in chapter 17, uh, it dealt with the issue of the cleansing of blood. And then chapter 18, dealt with the covering of our sexuality. And so it talks about sexual sins, in particularly in 18. And then we're going to see in verse uh, chapter 20, the punishment for that. But, you know, our sexuality probably is one of the areas which today in modern world is the greatest temptation and downfall for many, many Christians. And we... Uh, and for the world, I mean, uh, I, I deal, I mentor guys, I mentor, I walk guys through pornography. Pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it, it floods our computers. You cannot go on to, a, even YouTube, just go on to YouTube, and you got flashes of, you know, trying to entice you into different ones of nudity and of different things. But you go even outside of YouTube, which is supposed to be non uh, pornographic, <laughs> and uh, but then you go outside of that, and it's bomb. It's everywhere. I mean, there's images, and and for the guys, it, it's a hard thing to avoid it. And you know, the men are made and stimulated by visual images, and suddenly, you know, like it's it's a tough thing, and guys really need to fight against it and to take a constant stand against it. But um, sexuality is the enemy's way of taking, uh, this distorting God's original purpose for our sexuality, for a man, a woman, together, covenant marriage, no sex outside of marriage, no uh, distortion and perversion of sex. That was God's original uh, purpose. Family was increasingly, was very, very important in the uh, beginning, right from Adam and Eve. And uh, yet family now is being destroyed by the enemy. Uh, families are just decimated by the enemy. And now we see uh, governments, even the, the, the government of Alberta, praise the Lord, it was, uh, the government was defeated uh, just recently in a new government, but their whole curriculum and, you know, we call the nanny law was that the government had total rights over the control of the children's education, including sexuality, including control and custody, everything. And it preempted parental rights. I mean, that's just destroying a family. They're saying government is your family um, control. And that's just totally contrary to the word. So we, we see this whole area of sexuality being extremely important. Chapter 19 talks about the conduct of God's people. Is that important today? Absolutely. 
uh, conduct is very important. Now, it, it gets distorted because some people believe that the, the conduct is more important than the relationship. Christians very often get that confused. And we think, that we, we base it on their conduct is who they are. And again, I mean, this person I was talking with last night, they were told by people who are prophetic in their understanding that because of an action that she had done, that God hated her, that God was angry at her, that God was punishing her. And I'm going, this is total garbage. He says, God does not, they told me that God's value of me is decreased because of what she had done. And I'm saying, God's value of you has not decreased. I mean, it, take the word and go into Colossians 1 and see that he sees you as holy, as blameless, as without reproach. That's how he sees you. And your value has not decreased. He, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do that will make him love you less. Now, you need to get that in your head. You need to hear that. I, need, I said to her, I wish I could just take your head and make a switch and go click. And you would understand that his love for you is not going to change. You're just because you have sinned, he still loves you intensely. I said, my children have sinned when we were growing up. They still dis disobey at times. Now they have their own families. They'll do things that I wish they would not do, but my love does not change for them. My love stays constant for them, and it will never change. I may disagree with what they've done, I mean, wish they were in a better spot, maybe spiritually, whatever. But that doesn't change my love, doesn't change their value in my eyes. They, and, and that's the way it is with God. But we need to see that. So saying all of that, I just wanted to go on to say the key verses that deal with the command is uh, in Leviticus is holy, to be holy. But again, as I say, sometimes that comes, it's going to come through a little different. In the holiness in the Old Testament, it's going to do conduct. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, but also uh, what they eat and what they wear, uh, what they drink, different things like that will have an impact on and their sacrifices that they offer, everything. So in the Old Testament, we'll see that the word for holy, the one that's most used is Kodesh. And it appears 92 times in Leviticus alone. So this is the book of Leviticus is about holiness for sure, 458 times in the Old Testament. Wow. <clears throat> so holiness is important. Now, in Leviticus 23, we're going to see, um, very, that's chapter 20, verse 3. In a moment, we'll get, we'll get to this. But it's, uh, we do see this Kadesh show up. And it says, I will set my face against that man and cut him off from the people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech. We're going to talk about Molech as well. To defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. Now that word there is Kadesh. And it, it, it's a primary one. But then there's another one that's also very, it's rooted in the same uh, Hebrew as Kadesh is Kadosh. Kadosh, and it means also holy. It appears 20 times in Leviticus, 117 times in the Old Testament, and we see that one coming up in uh, Leviticus, Leviticus 11. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, and then there it says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You see that now? So when he, this one is talking about it's not just his holy name. It's talking about, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We see that in Leviticus 19. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So again, that kadosh is important. And, and then we see it in Leviticus 20, which is a chapter we're going to be looking at. And it says, and you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord. I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Don't you love that last part? That you should be mine. And so I just want to just leave that. Now, one of the theme verses of Leviticus is be holy for I am holy. And we're going to talk about 
what that actually means, why God says this, be holy for I am holy. And many people dismiss this and say, no one can be holy like God. I'm saying, you don't understand. In the Old Testament, that was very, very difficult. But the, the view of holiness was a little bit different as well because it meant being separate more than we consider holiness as being uh, an, a moral and, and absolute in, in your conduct and your purity. There, it contained that, but it was also following the law, uh, obeying certain of the rituals, etc. But being separate was a major one. You were different from the other people. You're called to be different for a different purpose. That's major in the Old Testament. Um, uh, the phrase, I am the Lord, and I am the Lord your God, appears <clears throat> 46 times in Leviticus. Did I put that in there? Yes. And, um, and that's a really important one, that I am the Lord. And that's Yahweh, okay? The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You see that in the King James and New King James versions. The others do not carry that through. So the thing here is that, again, um, God keeps saying to you, you need to understand that I am Lord over everything. And, and that he really wants the people to have that. Now, I believe he still wants that to be ingrained in us. Amen. That I am Lord. I am Lord. And I am the Lord, your God. He still wants that. And I don't think very often as we as believers have the, that intensity. And we say, say, oh, he's God. I mean, he's, he's God. And we add him on to our agenda. So I'm going to do this and this and this. I'm going to decide this, this, and this. And uh, well, what about the Lord? I, and I, again, last night I was saying, you're making things and people that what they say to be your Lord. They, are, they have more power over you than the Lord himself and his word, what it says. And so you need to decide that he is Lord and he is revealed through his word. So we need to be in his word to see who he is, but he is Lord. And you have to establish that. And, you know, I said last week or whenever I was talking about the, um, the last couple of messages I had, you know, there's certain things in my life that I have established before I get into a, a difficult situation. If I'm going to go into a difficult situation and try to work out my theology <laughs> about what I believe, that's a bad time because I'm going to be in an emotional state probably. So suddenly my finances crash or somebody dies or some terrible thing happens to my, my house gets burned down or something. That's not the time to be working out what I believe about God. Okay, I need to have it established ahead of time. So, like I have established, and I do this regularly, he is sovereign and he is supreme. I don't use the word God is in control because that's not a biblical term, but he is sovereign, that's talking about his authority. He is supreme, that's talking about his power. That's settled. I may not understand a lot of things, but I know no matter what is happening in my life, he is still sovereign. He is still supreme. He has authority in my life, and he has uh, power in my life and over my affairs. Number two, that he is a always does what is right. So even though it looks like things are bad happening, he does what is right. Number three is that uh, he, he is a loving God. He loves me intensely. And so I, I want that to be constantly in my life to know that he's not against me so even though the circumstance might be because often when we go through a circumstance for, for example the first thing we question is does God still love me if, if, if he was really a God of love he wouldn't allow this to happen would it would he that's not a question in my life if it's if no matter what happens he loves me period he loves me no matter what and even if it looks like he might not love me, he does. And I'm going to succumb to the, my, my determination that he loves me. So once I made that, it doesn't matter. Like I, if even it looks like he doesn't love me, I know he does. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through it. I'm saying, he loves me. <laughs> That's good enough for me. He always does his right, this right. And, 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 and 
and he will work through his purposes for me. So uh, that's important to do that. The lordship is so important. So let's go into uh, Exodus or Leviticus 20. Um, yeah, let's go through Leviticus 20. So I'm going to do it in sections. And the first section is from uh, verses 1 to 6. And in the, t the head of that is the rejection of those who give their children to Molech. Now, many, many people just dismiss this and they go, oh, the God Molech. And I'm going, you do you not understand that that same spirit of Molech is prevalent in our society today in such a way that you can tell me in a moment what, what, how you think it is, but I'll tell you what I believe it is. But let me just read uh, from Leviticus 20. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel, so it's not just for the children of Israel, but those who, who are not Jews, are not Israelites, who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man. I will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man uh, when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family. I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves uh, with him to commit harlotry with Molech. And the person who returns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Now, that is so amazingly serious that we look at this and we go, oh, my goodness, what is happening? Now, very quickly, I just want to go through, uh, uh, when we talk about Molech, why this is so important. In the Hebrew, Molech, I mean, it is, that was a god, an Ammonite god, but the Ammonite god was called Molech. Now, we don't know how that he became Molech. Many believe that it was a direct affront to the word king, which is Melech. And we know that, you know, we, we say that um, when we do the Shabbat, what, how do we say it? Uh, yeah, Melech And so, yeah, and so uh, that's king of the world. And, and the, the, so the Molech, because in Hebrew, there's no vowels. So you've got only consonants. So Molech is actually M, L, and the C-H. The hat sound is, is, is Molech, but Melech is the same. So here the pagans have made Molech to be their god, king, their king, if you will. And so he was king. And so what we see, if you have, go to, on, before I go to the notes, you will see in Leviticus 18, we see Molech's name appearing, uh, and it says, and you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So we see this uh, in Leviticus 18, and we see this in 2 Kings 23, verse 10. And Josiah was the one who actually reversed all that had been done by the previous kings and uh, going right back to the very beginning uh, that had come. And, and Josiah, Josiah defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Does anybody know where this, that yeah. is? Yeah, yeah. The, it, it's the valley of Hinnom. That's where they were. They burnt uh, their... Uh, Molech had sacrifices, burning um, of their children, uh, sacrifices to Molech right there. And then later on, because nobody wanted to touch it, it just became a place where they burned the garbage. Okay. And, and garbage 24 7 would be burning in the, Gehenna. and that's where we get hell, Gehenna, from Jesus talked about Gehenna. It's translated as hell in English. Gehenna was from the Valley of Hinnom, which is where Molech 
the sacrifices were had done with the children to Molech. And so that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Molech. So you hear about the fire and you hear Molech, and we'll see that in a moment. And then Jeremiah 32 says, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom. That's the again, you see the uh, Molech, and then it comes to begin Hannah in, in our uh, translation in English from Jesus, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sink. Not sin. Now it's, here it's an abomination, abomination to do this. That abomination is very, very bad, by the way. Um, uh, I'm going to just stop there for, well, I'll, I'll continue. No, I'll stop there for a second. Go back to your notes. And I, I put in there, um, Molech was the god of the Ammonites. You have to remember that, the Ammonites, okay? Um, they're not only the Ammonites, but they're the ones that came up with it. They built a metal image of Molech. And Molech was, uh, had a, like a, a look like a king, look like a man, but it was a huge, huge metal form with arms like step holding out in front of them with the hands out as if receiving something. And they would have fire that would be in the, if you want, the crotch of, of, of the king, of this metal thing, a huge fire that would cause all of the metal to just be burning, glowing hot, just burning. And what they would do was that they would take their children and bring their little infants to a Molech and put it in the arms. And it's, you know, you could imagine. Now, you, you, the screaming that would be going on with the babies and everything else would be hor horrific. So they would have drums that be playing at the highest intensity possible. They would have many of the ones who were so-called worshipers of Molech, the priests, would be crying out with you know, screams and pra well, praises, I suppose, to Molech, but, but shouts and things to drown out the screams of the babies. Now, they believed that they were giving these babies as a sacrifice to appease Mola king, and so that they would, their lives would be better and they would be fruitful. They didn't take all their babies. They would often just take the first or certain of the ones, and they would uh, put them out. Could you imagine bringing the children and then giving them to Mola? Now, before you get too offended by all of that, I would ask you, are we any different today? I mean, I, I'm part of Right to Life, and uh, I, I, I was just shocked this past month. What, do you know what happened in New York State? Yeah. Yeah. Abortions that were not aborted completely, and the child was born after an abortion attempt, they have now given permission for the state, for the doctors, to kill that alive child that survived abortion. I mean, it was bad enough when they went to third term, third trimester abortions, because when you go to the third trimester, it's, not, it's, not, it's a very difficult thing to abort a, a, a child. Uh, a they call it a fetus. Or it's, it's a child. It's fully formed. But you actually have to go in and you have to hack it apart in the womb. You have to physically hack it apart and it's screaming and it's uh, and, and, and then you have to pull it out very often. I mean, and you say, oh, well, that was horrible what they did with the children and Molech and how could we, nobody could ever, I'm saying we're doing the same thing. We're allowing the same thing, only we just turn our eyes away from it. Or uh, many, many just say, I, I give my child to abortion, but I, it, it's not really a child. It's just something in me, you know, or they call it a fetus, maybe, or a blob or something. But you, you've given it over. We do the same thing. I think it's a, one of the main uh, things that we're going to answer for. So these, you know, this whole thing with Molech, 
was was very very important. Now, just going on with the whole theme of there, in Psalm 106, it God again He wants to really impress upon us why why this is so important. He says, he's, and he's talking about the in, in Psalm 106, the the how the Jewish people, the Israelites turn to other gods. He says, they did not destroy the people concerning whom the God had commanded them. We went into the land. They were supposed to destroy the nations. They did not do that. They, they did in some cases, but they didn't do it completely against what God said. God even sent hornets ahead of them so they could win the battles, but they didn't do it for various reasons. But they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. And so they, they it was just too appealing to them to see the people, and for whatever reason, maybe it doubtly it was uh, doubtful it was sympathy, but it was because they wanted to as well just to join with them, beautiful women and whatever, and and come together. And they served their idols, which became a snare to them because there was an enticement of the sexuality. Most all of pagan worship involves sexuality, so men could go with temple prostitutes, you could have sex, you could actually go and say you're worshiping by having sex with uh, another woman. Um, and, and, and that was a desirous thing to the, to the carnal sensuality. But God says, this is a snare. They even sacrifice their sons and their daughters to demons. So God even sees in the midst of this is demons. It's, it's a and then it says, and they shed innocent blood. Now, I just want to stop. Whenever you see innocent blood, this is not talking about people, adults who are innocent. It's almost always referring to children. The innocent blood are children. You'll see it come up again. And the blood of their, and it actually says, the innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters. Okay? And it says, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. Now, there's the idols of Canaan. That would, uh, Ammonites were part of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. I believe the Lord would say Canada, United States, with what we're doing, is polluted with blood as well. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. So we come and oh my goodness. Now in 1 Kings um, chapter 11, if you want to just go there for a moment, because again, Something happened there, and you know here we have uh, the wisest man in the world, who is Solomon. It says, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, and again, this enticement with sexuality and of having uh, here in the, in the King James version it says strange women, <laughs> in, in the New King James says foreign women. That's people who were outside of the Israelite uh, tribes. And it says, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, that's where the number uh, Molech was worshipped, Edomites, Sidonites, uh, Sid Sidonians, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Well, probably lust, but it says love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as it was the heart of Father David. For Solomon uh, went after Ashtoreth, and the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom and the abomination of the Ammonites, that's probably Milcom is associated with Malak. Um, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Then Solomon built high places for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is east of Jerusalem. And for Molech, Solomon built things for Molech, temple shrines for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. Uh, and he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry at Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord, our God, who appeared to him twice and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, 
but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and you've not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Wow. And, and this is the wisest man in the world. And you say, how could he do that? Well, again, our carnality, our flesh is so strong at times, it just takes over. In 2 Kings 21, 6, and it says, Manasseh, he was one of the words. Now, he did, Manasseh did come to the Lord at the very end, but God said, I'm going to continue to punish for what you did. But Manasseh was an evil, evil king, perhaps the worst of the kings. But in Manasseh, it says, made his son pass through the fire. That's referring to going to, to Molech. Practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So you can see all these things. They, they, get, they get involved with the occult. They get involved with demons. It says, more and moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood. That's talking about children. Till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides his sins by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So when you talk about God's judgment on some of the things that are happening, we see it was not just for small sins. This was huge. Now, the reasons for this command to be holy um, in verse 7 and 8. So go back to um, um, Leviticus 20 and read verse 7 and 8. And it says, consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So we see that this command is for God to them for to be uh, holy, to consecrate themselves. And for be holy, I am holy. You shall keep my statutes and perform them. I'm the God, the Lord who sanctifies me. So God is calling this uh, for a reason. And the reason for this is because that's who God is. God says, I am holy, and I want you to be holy. Now, Peter picks up on this in 1 Peter 1, verse 15 and 16. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So he, this applying it to conduct here, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now, many times in the church, what we think we have to become holy, we have to do uh, certain acts to become holy, when uh, I'll come at the end and, and, and just finish off with saying, no, we are made holy by Jesus, by what his death on the cross. And Colossians 1 Verse 22 actually says that you and I, through what Jesus has done, we are holy and blameless and without reproof, repute, without reproach. We, that's who we are. Now, we are called to act it out. We are called to, in our conduct, act it out. But we don't become holy by doing good works or by holy works or by reading your Bible or by simply praying. That's not how you become holy. And sometimes we have that idea. Well, you know, I, I, would be, I would become holy if I just did this. I, if I just fasted once a week, if I just prayed every day, if I just, then I would become holy. And God would be pleased with my, no, you are holy. He wants you to act out the holiness with your conduct. And, but the people here in, in Leviticus, it's a little different because they were called by their conduct to act out holiness. They, were in a, they would love to be where we're at and have the Lord living in them. But in it, the result of those who do, do not honor their parents. So again, when we see Leviticus, we're actually, in many ways, seeing that the Ten Commandments are being acted out here because every one of these uh, verses deal with the Ten Commandments that were given on, uh, to Moses on the mountain. But verse 9, for everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who has cursed his father or mother, his blood shall be upon them. Now that's a really serious command about fathers and mothers um, and to honor them. 
this is again for many many Christians. And again, just this week, I was talking to someone who, you know, had a major falling out with their parents, her parents. And um, when I'm talking with them, I I I, I call them. They were, you know, basically she wanted no relationship with her parents, and uh, her father has passed away in this case. But the mother is very, very difficult um, and maybe abusive I, from her point of view. But the thing is, so she wants nothing to do with it. And so she's coming to me and says, is that okay with God no. for me to have nothing to do with my parent? I want no relationship with her. I want nothing to do with her. And I said to her, that doesn't sound like honor to me. And you're called to honor your parents. Now, I understand what they have, she, they have done, and she has done in this case. And, but I'm saying we are called to honor the office, certainly, of your mother. But I also you're called to honor her as a person, despite what she has done. And that's a hard thing, I know, for us, because we don't separate our, the conduct of a person and who they are. And Jesus can, God does. He loves us, even though... When we were still enemies, still had not been dedicated, he still loved us. He can separate the person from the acts, but we often can. So I said, would you ask the Lord how you could honor your mother? What do you think that would be look like? And so she said, well, she named some things. I said, no, that's not honoring your mother. Honor means to give high value to. It means to esteem highly. How could you show your mother? that you esteem her. See, I believe that many times we react to bad behavior, parents, by our own bad behavior, and the next thing you know, uh, there's fights going on, there's words been said, uh, all kinds of things. But if sometimes I've seen where a person suddenly changes their attitude, and we do seminars on this, they change their attitude towards their parents, they suddenly now value them and see them highly, despite what they have done, or they're, what they haven't done or have done, and they, they begin to honor their parents, and guess what? Everything changes. Yeah. God works through it, and restoration takes place in many, many cases, and suddenly we see uh, everything shifts because we're honoring God. Now, in, in, and here's another verse here. Look at this verse here. This is a tough one. <laughs> I have to admit, Deuteronomy 21, 18 and 21. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, bring him to, to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all of Israel shall hear and fear. Now, this is there. God was doing this for a very specific purpose, dealing with uh, the uh, rebellion. Um, and we need to look at it again from the eyes of the New Testament. We see that that is not in place for today. So when you read that, you don't say, well, I've got a rebellious son, so I'm going to take him to the elders of the church and then put him to death. You know, like, no, 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 that's not, that's not looking at it from a New Testament view. But that is in the Old Testament, absolutely. And it was showing the severity of of honoring your father and your mother. Uh, also, I, I know in Proverbs twenty twenty it says, "Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness." Mm -hmm. So I say to uh, ones who are having trouble and, and, and cursing and saying bad things about their father and mother, be careful. Your lamp will be put into deep darkness. So even though you may have problems with your, be careful. And of course, I love this one, Deuteronomy 5.16. I just quoted this one to somebody this week too as well. I said, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. And I said, uh, that's a beautiful promise. Eh? It is to, to honor your father and mother. It's not just a, the, the, the punishment. But it's actually saying, look, your days will be long. And I believe when it says long, that means healthy as well. 
you know, that you're living with, and it be well with you. <laughs> so they they fit together. I like the I don't, I nest, don't necessarily want to live to I'm 100, but I, I I like to live long, and I want it to be well and healthy. And that you know, I believe that this is a, a promise for us. So that you know, I, I I love the importance of that. Again, Ten Commandments. Then God's attitude towards sexual sin. So this is where we get into uh, some amazing ones, verses 10 to 21. I'm just going to read it. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Wow. Verse 11. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Now, we've talked about this before. Uncovering the father's nakedness normally means you're sleeping with it. It's, it's sexual uh, intercourse taking place. Um, and, and again, it comes up again and again in the scriptures. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Wow. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abortion. He shall be surely put to death. Abomination. What did I say? Abortion. Abomination. <laughs> they shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, if a man marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire. <laughs> not, well, not only killed here, but burned with fire. Both he and they, that they shall be no wickedness among you. If a man mates with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. It's called bestiality or bestiality. If a woman approaches any animal and mates with it, it shall you shall kill the woman and the animal, and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, that would be... Um, step, daughter, step. Sister. Yeah, step, yeah. And sees her nakedness, that's again a code for um, intercourse, and sees, her, and sees his nakedness, it's a wicked thing, and they shall... Cut off in the sight of the people, he has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear the, his guilt. And if a man lies with a woman during her sickness, that's her menstrual period, and uncovers her nakedness, he has exposed her flow, and she has uncovered the flow of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, nor of your father's sister, for that would uncover his near of kin. They shall bear their guilt. Verse 20. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered her uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, and they shall die childless. That doesn't mean they shall have no children. It means they, when they die, they, 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 the children will have died before them, it appears. That's what the commentators say. Now, if a man takes his brother's wife, it's an unclean thing. He's uncovered her mother's nakedness. They shall be childless. They shall have no children. Uh, and, and and I think that, yeah, that's in there. So I just want to go through, and, and when we're looking at that whole area of of uh, sexual sins, it, it in, in talking about different le levels, adultery, incest, perversion, homosexuality, witness, bestiality, uh, sexual uncleanness. It was very, very important to the Lord. Um, I also put on the next page uh, of the outline, you know, there was not just these crimes that had capital punishment associated with them, but there were 15 different offenses in Israel that um, where there was capital punishment. And I just put them, I'll put them up on the screen. It's in your notes too. Um, striking or cursing a parent, breaking the Sabbath, blaspheming God, engaging in occult practices, prophesying falsely, adultery, rape, unchastity, before marriage, oh my goodness, uh, unchastity before marriage, uh, that's having sex before marriage, you know how, how often, you know, many people would be killed nowadays, because there's very, very few, even in the Christians, that keep their purity, and be ready to marriage, I mean, we, we, we lose most of our church, uh, incest, homosexuality, wow, bestiality, bestiality, uh, kidnapping, idolatry, 
false witness in the case involving capital crime, killing of a human intentionally. Now, when, when God, uh, somebody said about this whole list here, um, if, if, well, and in Leviticus 20 as well, if you were to deal with this in the way that they did in, say, in Leviticus 20 with sexuality, we would cut out all pornography within a year, they said, from our society if we were to implement it. I mean, that, that would never happen. But you would can totally eradicate all pornography and all the perversion that, that comes out of that. One day, it's going to be eradicated. Um, but, but this was here set in place, and God was doing it for a purpose. You know, it's amazing, and many people don't understand. They seem, see these things about sexuality, and why would God do this? He was really, really ultimately interested in the purity of the people. Because even today, look at all the sexual diseases that our society is ridiculed with. Look, I mean, even in Africa, where the, of course, they're trying to control it with AIDS and all kinds of the things. AIDS is only one of many, many of the diseases that when you are promiscuous, when you involve yourself in sexuality and different forms of sexuality, men with men, women with women, even with animals, etc., cetera, uh, what you get to in, in incest, you get the, uh, generations and generations of disease and sickness. And God is just saying, I'm trying to keep you pure and holy. You may see it as being very strong and, and, and I hate you. I not hate you. I love you. And I'm trying to protect you. So again, when we look at this, be very, very careful. Um, you know, uh, we see God as a God of hate. He's not a God of hate. He's a God of love. He put things into place for people that to, to, to do. And the, he still loves the people. He's given us some different ways to act now, but he still loves us intensely and wants our purity. Now, the next one is the obedience in Israel's inheritance to the land. That's verse 22 to 24. And it says, how am I doing the time? Oh, wow. Okay. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I'm casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit the land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. For I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. So you even see here, he's saying, like, I'm going to give you the land, but uh, uh, the inheritance is based on obedience, yes, but I'm going to call you to be separate and to follow me, follow my laws, and I will give you that land filled with milk and honey. That was his promise. And so he wanted us, uh, the, the people to be separate. And that goes on in verse 25, uh, going right into 26. It says, you shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. You shall not make yourselves abominable <laughs> abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing which creeps on the ground which I have separated you as unclean and you shall be holy to me for I am the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine now I, I just want to reinforce this is that yes he had them do the certain animals were clean and unclean that was part of protection as well, by the way, when we went through this a, a few weeks back, you know, looking at how many of the animals that were forbidden are animals that carry disease, and certainly in those times carry disease or potentially it was a protection more than anything, but not only. But he called them to be separate. He said, you have to understand the only way I, uh, that I could, that, that you're going to stay true to me is if you stay separate and and are obedient because you're going to mingle with the others you're going to be polluted and you're going to follow them you're going to turn away from me and i'm going to lose you and i love you you are mine now 
I just close with this part by saying, um, you know, I, I, I was praying the other day and I was just saying, Lord, um, why do you deal in with even today with certain uh, people in certain ways? And it, it, it was very strong. I, I believe I'm hearing right. He's saying, because I love you so much, I am jealous over you. And when you involve yourself with these other things, with the world's practices, with, the, with various temptations of the world, you are going to be turned away from me. You're going to be distracted from me. And I value you. And I value our relationship. And I, I'm jealous over you. And so as a result, I, I, yeah, he, he acts maybe in what we might be considered extreme ways even today. Because he says, I value, I want to keep you with me unpolluted. And separated unto myself. I, I don't know if that helps or not. So it's 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 basically he loves us so much he'll do everything to hold us and to keep us, and even times he'll chastise us and discipline us. He will do things to stop us from from disobey. Now, and sometimes we might think it's a good thing. We might be reacting against another person, and 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 he'll say he'll stop that because. Their sin is causing us to sin. And he's saying, so I'm going to interfere with that, not because I'm angry that you're sinning, but your, your sin is causing you to be separate from me. And so I need to stop that so that you and I can go on with a relationship. And, and, and I, 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 I preach this, and I, I know I've asked a couple of people have asked me to clarify it for them. And for my sermon that I preached um, the last time, was basically is that that God desires us so much to be in a relationship with him that he wants us to understand that the things that distract us from that relationship hurt uh, hurt him is not the right word it 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 causes well pain in the sense of a relationship that's separate from him is not him. He loves us so much. He wants us all for himself. He wants us to do not allow anything that would distract that relationship, break that relationship, or to cause it to deteriorate. And so he will protect that relationship. And so he does things that cause you might, we might think, he doesn't love me. No, it is because he loves us that he's doing it. And we think, oh, he doesn't love me. Oh, he's mad at me. No, no, he's saying, I just don't want you to sin because it's going to cause you to have a separation in our fellowship. And we can't communicate. We can't, and, and, and I don't want that to happen. And so I will do this to make it, to change it. And we go, oh. Oh, I didn't know you loved me so much. Wow. So, um, the, 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 and then, the, of course, we want to go uh, versus uh, the separation. I did that. In verse 20, 27, just to end off. And a man or a woman who is a medium or who has uh, familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with their stones. Their blood shall be upon them. And this, this one, we come to that whole area. Uh, he wants you, first I said, separate from the nations. Oh, um, let me just go back for a way. We are still called to be separate, by the way, even in the New Testament. You know, in 2 Corinthians 6, it's like, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. We don't follow that always too much in the church. Uh, for what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord is Christ with the law? What Heart has the believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And so we see that. And then, of course, I was saying uh, the whole thing with the occult. And even Christians don't understand. Even today, I mean, they read their horoscopes, they fool around with occult type of things. 
Uh, the children get involved with various things on whether you know, Ouija boards used to be the big thing, but now there's all kinds of things like tarot cards and fortune tellings and, and, and different other practices. And God is saying, these are a real problem. These I, are abomination to me. And they break our relationship. And he loves us so much, he does not want us to be involved. In and in Isaiah 8, it talks about, and when they say to you, seek these, those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, uh, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living <laughs> to the law and to the testimony? If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And so he's talking about uh, it might appear that they have knowledge and insight and uh, future telling, but there's no light there. Very often we get enticed into that because we want to know the future and it's a problem. So I want to end off and not spend much time, but just to end off this whole topic. And so what do we mean by holy or holiness when we talk? Just a few th thoughts. Uh, in the Old Testament, particularly, the grammatical meaning of holy, holiness, is to set apart, to be separate. And the people of Israel were called to be separate, to be different. It also can mean, in a general sense, to set apart for any special purpose. And God did set the Jewish people, the Israelites, apart for a special purpose. What was that special purpose? Light. To be a light to the nations. He called them to be a light to the nations. They still are a light to the nations, by the way, but um, they would be a greater light if they followed him fully and embraced Yeshua. As their, what a fantastic light they would be then. But in the meantime, we are called to be lights. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But then he said to the disciples and to us, you are the light of the world. So we're, we're set apart for a very special purpose. And in Hosea, though, it, it actually, this can be used negatively. He says, the, the people <laughs> separated themselves with harlots. <laughs> That's the word uh, as well. It comes from holy. They, it, it, it's using the same Kadesh, but not in the holiness sense that we think. They set them apart to go with harlots. But that's the negative sense. It's not very often used. It is used in Hosea and a couple other places. The religious meaning means to set apart for God and for his use. And we'll see that holiness come up um, in, in, in Genesis 2, 3. And it talks about he sanctified the seventh day. He made holy the seventh day, the day of rest. Okay? So that's for a special purpose and use. And it also says in uh, Je uh, Exodus 19, 14, it says, he sanctified the people. God from the mountain, remember in Exodus 19, he sanctified the people. Now, when you, you, it sounds like he made them holy in the sense that we think of holiness, but in actual fact, it means I've set you apart for my special purpose, which was to be a light to the world. And so we see that. And then the moral meaning is to set apart from sin. Now that's in the New Testament is very predominant. And so we see it again and again. He, we are called to be set apart, but in the sense of from sin. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians 4, which I forgot to put it in there, but you can look it up for yourself. So how are Christians made holy? Okay, there are three, well, two ways, really. Uh, third one, I, I'll, I'll put a caveat to it. But number one is by the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I are made holy by the blood of Jesus. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, covetous nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And it goes, and such were some of you. But, you were washed, just implying by the blood. You were sanctified, that's you were made holy. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, the, and the, by the Spirit of our God. Then we see in Hebrews 10, verse 10 and on. 
And we have been sanctified, that's made holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. He's talking about the Old Testament here. But this man, referring to Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time waiting, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So it talks about us that we are being perfected in, we are made sanctified and we're being perfected in that sanctification, which is uh, made holy. But then in Hebrews 13, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. So we, we are made holy by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And suffered outside the gate, therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So it, we're, we're sanctified, made holy by blood. That's, that's primary. But in a couple of places, we're made uh, holy by the word. That's why being in the word is so important as well. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them. This is Jesus' prayer. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So that we're sanctified by the word, if you will, there. And as you sent me into the world, I also sent them in the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. The truth where? From the word. And what will set you free? The truth. And I, he says, stay in my word. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's why we need to be in the word daily. And uh, and do then in Ephesians 5 it also husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her I wish I could get every man every husband to really understand that verse <laughs> to love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave an act like Christ did to the church which would be good that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. So we're washed by the word. You see that? That he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that should be that we that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, this is a verse that I heard a preacher just uh, a week ago say, and I, I, I objected to it. He says, We are not going to be holy until the Lord returns. And he used this verse. And I'm saying you're wrong. Uh, we are made holy, uh, but we will be made fully holy, completely holy, and we will not ever sin again when Jesus returns, okay? But look at the way this verse says. You can see where he misinterpreted, I believe. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And so they, <clears throat> he was using this that God of peace will sanctify you. You know, he has sanctified us. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So he was reading it, he will do it. And I'm saying, no, he's saying, I will do it. And it was done at the cross. And he's doing it for anyone who will. Denying yield himself hmm? denying. yeah denying the cross to a, yeah to a high degree now i just close off with this are we really holy and it, i've used these verses and I, I close off very very quickly i believe colossians 1 21 and 22 and it says and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. Now, and that's why I, I, I just wanted to say, and, and, and he adds, and blameless and above reproach in the sight. I've used this several times this morning already. And one of this person I was using that past verse, he said, you have been made holy in position by the blood of Christ. You have been made holy but you're still a dirty, rotten sinner. 
and I'm saying, I'm not a dirty, rotten mm -hmm. sinner. I said, I'm actually called a saint. Now, why is that important? How you see yourself is very, very important. So if I see myself, according to the word, that I'm holy and blameless and without reproach, if I see myself, then I will become like that. Because what you look at, what you see, is what you will become. If you see yourself as a sinner, a dirty, rotten, no good sinner, which says he used, that we are, then every time you sin, you justify it and say, well, of course, I sin because that's what I am. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. That's what sinners do. We sin. And I'm going, no, I am not a dirty, rotten sinner. I might sin occasionally. That does not make me a dirty, rotten sinner. I might go golfing occasionally. I'm not a golfer. Okay, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do certain things, but I, that doesn't make me, you know, I, I might cook occasionally, very, very, very occasionally. It does not make me a cook, okay? My wife would tell you that. And, and so you know, I, I, what you are, what you see, how you see yourself is, and then, of course, the next one is 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God. And so I'm saying... He has made us, and you know, mean wisdom of God. We have wisdom. As a matter of fact, James talks about if you desire wisdom, just ask him. He'll give it to you liberally. He withholds it not. But we are the wisdom of God. That's who we are. So very often when I'm going through a circumstance, I will say, you've already given me wisdom. I just need to access it here. You know, I, I want the wisdom. I have it. It's given. It, 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 it's just part of the package. But not only am I the wisdom of God, but he says, and, and righteousness. You don't know what righteousness means? My righteousness means that there's no sin. Righteousness means right standing with him. I have righteousness. And then, of course, he uses the word sanctification. That's holiness. That's the, well, it's not in the Greek. In the Greek, it's hagios, but in the, in the Old Testament, it would be kadash or kadosh. And uh, it's sanctification. I, I am holy. I am made holy. And then I love the last one, and redemption. And redemption. One of the meanings of redemption is restored to created value. Restored to the way we originally were made by Adam, in, in, through God in Adam and Eve, restored to the image and likeness of God. That's, re, that's what we're redeemed to. We're redeemed to that spot. So for myself, I see myself, and people say, That's, isn't that kind of um, arrogant to say you're righteous and you're holy and you're redeemed, restored to creative value? I go, no, that's how he sees me, through the cross, through the blood. That's who I am. That's certainly who my spirit is with, linked with his spirit. I know my soul needs redeeming and needs renewing, I should say. It needs uh, my body certainly does need that as well. But that's my soul and my body is not who I am. My spirit is who I am because it will live forever. My spirit will dwell forever. I will have a new body. My soul will be linked up with my spirit, absolutely. But my spirit is who I am. I'm, I'm a spirit man. I have a body. No, I have a soul and live in a body, but I am a spirit. You don't understand that? I am a spirit. I have a soul that lives in a body. Okay? And so that's who I am. And it, in my, at that spirit level, I am righteous. I am holy. I am redeemed. And so when I live it out, it makes it so easy because every time I come to an uh, area where temptation and, 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 and the world and sin, you know what happens? When I know who I am, it, it, yeah, it goes, ah, no, stay away from that. Hey, that's not good, Joe. <laughs> and my relationship with the Lord takes supremacy over that temporary temptation to sin or whatever it may be. And I go, oh, that's so easy. It's not like, I, oh, I got to fight against this. I got to fight against this. I got to resist it. I got to do it. I, 
I mean, I, I, I do resist it, but it's not like that's my, some people live their whole life. I get up in the morning. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to do any sin. I'm going to stay away from sin. I'm not going to, I'm going to resist the world. They live their lives that way. Really? I mean, I counsel them sometimes and I'm saying, no, rest in who you are and allow your, who you are to warn you by the spirit. Hey, whoa, stay away. That's not good. You know what? What they're saying is not good. That's not good. And then you go, okay, thank you. And I rest in you. I rest in my relationship with you. I rest in who I am. Thank you. That's who I am. And that, that changes. Colossians 1, 21, 22 ends with, in his sight. So it's God that's just is it? holy. Yeah. And, um, and, and, I, and that's good. Thank you. A, in his sight, yeah. it says. And that's why I say it's like, you can see yourself as you see yourself, which is normally negative, or you can see yourself as he sees you. And I'm going to live as he sees me. And that makes a big difference in how I live. Father, we just thank you today. And we just pray, you know, the whole thing with holiness, that we would come to understand it as it's, oh, the people of Israel would love to have had the opportunity to live on the, this side of the cross, um, to have you dwell in them, to have Holy Spirit dwell in them, to have Jesus, have Abba Father dwell in them. And so, Lord, we just say thank you for that. We do not take that for granted. And we thank you that you have given us and empowered us the ability to live in holiness in which they never had the opportunity to live. But, but Lord, you knew that from the beginning. That was part of the plan. That was what you were doing. That's what you had worked out. And, Lord, uh, you did these extreme things at times because you, their relationship with you was so precious. And your relationship with us is so precious that you do things that sometimes might appear extreme as well. But Lord, we come today and we just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray for Israel on their Independence Day. We pray that Jewish people across the world will come to the place of understanding who you are, Yeshua, Jesus, and will follow you and will come to that place of understanding that you have given to us. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you have given to each of us, and I pray we'll walk it out day by day. It won't be, uh, it won't be a, <laughs> a huge chore. It will be just walking in relationship, walking with you, walking in holiness, walking for who you created us to be. And so, Lord, thank you. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I preached my heart out today, so I hope that helped. <laughs>